uh, I love your movie, um, and, and a, a big reason why I love it is because it's. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'm grateful for any movie that's recognizably human, uh, especially this day <laughs> and age. Uh, but secondly, um, it, it kind of it delves into um, an area of, of, of life and, and womanhood and parenthood that isn't typically covered by movies. Uh, is that part of the appeal of, of this project for you? Definitely. I mean, you know, as a, as a parent myself now, it's, um, it's just a lot of conversations that my wife and I have and a lot of topics that are relevant to us that I'm not seeing in the movies. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of always been a goal of mine to try and make work that is shedding light on certain topics or, you know, giving people who don't normally have a voice in the media a chance to talk about something. And, you know, that was absolutely the case with this one that, you know, a lot of the experiences that especially my wife was having after our son was born, you know, I just wasn't uh, hearing or seeing. And so, you know, I attempted to build a movie around the chance to give these women of an ability to talk about these scenes and, and get into some of that stuff. In the, I mean, when you, when you have a child, uh, I mean, as it's portrayed in the film, I mean, it does it does kind of emblemize a, a seismic shift in your life, uh, and and you you want to you want to hold on to the identity you had before the child, uh, and yet I mean the rules are different. I mean your life is irrevocably <laughs> different, no matter what you do. It's, so that's a really difficult kind of balancing act to figure out. Yeah, it was, you know, it was interesting to try and kind of balance it on both sides of the line, to have these two young parents and then to have the, you know, this younger sister comes to live with them who really is just not there, you know, and it's, in a lot of ways, it's not her fault that she's not there, that she made different choices. She doesn't have a kid. She's allowed her youth, you know, but, um, but it does prove tricky for these characters to figure out, you know, what, what those responsibilities are. And also I agree for the parents, um, there are a lot of questions about who am I now and, and what does that mean? What does that say about me? Yeah. Is there, is there a moment for you and, and maybe it was the birth of your child when, when you felt like, Oh, I'm grown up all of a sudden. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I was I was sort of a, very early within my friend group to get married. We were the first of our close friends to have a kid. So, you know, I've, I've always kind of felt a little ahead of the curve in terms of that kind of stuff. But, you know, I do remember having a lot of these conversations with other men, in particular in my mid to late 20s, where, you know, it seemed so clear to us when we were young that our fathers were men, you know, and, and that we didn't have a very good gauge of, of whether we had made that transition or not, or what that even meant anymore. And, you know, there, there is something very concrete about having a child where it puts a fine point on the fact that you are an adult and you are responsible for a young person now. And so I, you know, I do think that it's made me feel to to my parents in a lot of ways and and what they must have been going through when I was young you know by the time my son was born I I was 29 when my son was born my parents already had me and my two younger brothers by that age so it's it was very eye-opening to to feel the seismic shift uh in my own life and then kind of compare it to where my parents were at which is just you know everything I was going through plus two, you know, it's like really, yeah. uh, it's kind of interesting. And, and I do think that generationally, uh, my generation has been allowed to prolong that adolescence without a lot of, uh, you know, without a lot of pressure societally or from our peers to grow up. And in many ways that is nice. And, but I also see, Culturally, I see this reflected a lot. I mean, the, the kind of, you know, the the onslaught of 
superhero movies and, and that other stuff that you were talking about, you know, that's really seems to me to be a direct result of our extended adolescence. And, and when you look at, you know, I'll use the seventies as an example. When you look at studio filmmaking from the seventies, it's primarily focused on adults and adult concerns. And, you know, I just don't really see that anymore. That's been kind of shifted over to the specialty art house market. Yeah. Well, you know, when when this topic is brought up, I always kind of get on my soapbox. But I, I mean, I, I'm <laughs> a huge a huge fan of 70s cinema, uh, mostly because so many of those movies were invested in the real world and things that we were going through. But the culture was different then too, because you felt like the culture itself was more invested, and there seems to be more yeah. of an apathy nowadays, and, and you see that reflected in movies. I think so. It's uh, it's hard to tell, you know. I mean, we're we're very well connected now, so you know, I think that we're aware of a lot more than we used to be, including apathy. You know, so if you if you are just looking at it based on kind of what you're seeing, it just depends on where you're looking. You know, I, I, for instance, was on Twitter for about a year and a half and I, you know, I got off of there and a lot of that was just based on, you know, that becoming a priority for me in my life and not feeling that I wanted to be connected with that. But, Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's just a lot, I don't know, there's a lot of diversion, and so it's really hard. I do think that we have a really strong political culture. I do think that, you know, the popularity of something like The Daily Show is proof that a lot of people do care, and they are engaged, and they're tuning in every day to, to stay relevant and and to know what's going on in the world. But, you know, that's kind of one of 25 things they're doing that day. <laughs> you know, a lot of that is not so uh, great. Speaking of being connected, um, the the structure of of your filmmaking. I mean, you you, you write you write the structure out in in, in, in screenplay form, but the the dialogue yeah. is largely improvised. And um, and I would think that a lot of times actors say that they feel safest when when they feel like they can fall on their face and embarrass themselves and it's okay. But I would think yeah. that's especially, especially true when your film is improvised and, and cause that's a real kind of high wire place to be. Um, it, it, do you, do you find that the actors that you work with generally are extremely comfortable walking that high wire? You know, I, I don't know because often I, you know, their insecurities and their fears are not reaching me. You know, like I, I would be curious to eavesdrop on uh, private conversations about it, but I feel like everybody puts on a, a strong face when they get to set. And, uh, you know, but I, it, that is a lot of my job is to create an atmosphere that does feel safe and feels conducive to, collaboration and sharing of ideas and that's really fun for me too you know i i the way i look at it is i could sit at a laptop by myself and attempt to solve these storytelling problems or i could surround myself with really smart people and we could all talk through it together and so you know i've kind of opted for that latter approach and really built that into the way that i make movies and and so Anybody who's there on a, on one of my sets is is certainly not there to make money. You know, it's pretty. Uh, a lot of these actors are probably losing money to come and do my movie. So, you know, they're there to be challenged and they're there to involve themselves in that kind of process. And so, it, it's been really exciting to, uh, even if I am asking them to walk a high wire, to kind of be surrounded by people who are looking forward to to being up there. Well, and also for you as a director, this this approach that you've adopted uh, is also a high wire act because, at its best, when it's working, it can feel very intimate and spontaneous and profound. But if it doesn't work, uh, it can feel feel uh, aimless. 
how do you combat against that? I mean, do you when you start to work on a scene, do you really try to focus on okay, what is this scene about? I do. I you know, there's there's usually topics and things that are important to me that we're circling around throughout the movie and and sometimes they we take multiple stabs at it, you know, occasionally I'll try and get something into a scene and it just doesn't feel right in that scene. And so I'll, you know, I'll either create a new scene where we can get more specific or, or, you know, hope that it comes back and circles back around later. But, um, on set, I think what I'm mostly trying to do is make sure that each scene feels good by itself. And with the hope that, you know, 30 discrete scenes put together feels like a coherent and, and satisfying movie and then a lot of the work placed in the editing room once I've stuck those scenes together trying to look at the reality of what we've made and and then try and shape it into a movie you know that kind of plays more by movie terms but mm-hmm. um but you know I, I only have my gut to go by and and so if it feels good in the moment and it feels like it's on point and that it's sort of um, in one way or another connected to the story we're trying to tell, I'm excited by the meandering quality sometimes. And I think that, you know, when I think about my favorite movies, they're not necessarily straight lines from the beginning to the end. You know, they, there's some space in there to introduce some new ideas and to take a few detours. So it, it ends up kind of being a combination of, of all of that. One more question for you before I let you go. Uh, one of the aspects of, of of your character in the film that I find really fascinating is the the kind of the battle between your loyalty towards your new family that you've created and your birth family that you're stuck with no matter what. Uh, yeah. And, and, <laughs> I mean that that's kind of like a a catch twenty two. I mean, there's no diplomatic way to take one side or the other, is there? Well, that's exactly right. And and beyond that, also, you get used to your own family. You know, you, you get used to the ways in which your family disappoints you or annoys you. And, and that's a very different thing than in-laws. And so one of the fun dynamics that I wanted to play with in this movie is my relationship with my sister and my wife's relationship with my sister. And, you know, I am just a lot more used to her and, and a lot less shocked by her behavior. And, um, and I find that that's true in, in those dynamics, you know, you, you're stuck with family, but also you, you know, you kind of come to create a different set of rules for them. And, and it's based on a lifetime of knowledge. And when it, when it's in-laws, you really, you've married into them. And so in another way you're stuck with them, but, uh, you, you kind of take them more on their own terms and, and I feel like you see them more as an individual. And so um, in a lot of ways, I'm able to let Jenny off the hook throughout the movie and Melanie's character in other ways is able to propel her forward by seeing her as an independent adult and not just a little sister. So yeah. it's um, kind of the balance of those two viewpoints that I think allows Jenny to uh, grow up a little bit over the course of the movie, though not that much. 